I don't generally say that about service providers. Um, most service providers have misaligned incentives. They want something different from the customer. The customer wants this stuff done. The service provider wants to make money, which is fine, the customer knows they have to pay. But the service provider wants to keep making money. So their structures tend to align in such a way that they keep getting work from the customer. They'll do things that are in their interests over the customer's interests to keep an ongoing relationship, an ongoing financial relationship. Okay, but these guys are actually pretty good. They've been there a long time, they're nice people to work with, which helps, but they are outsourced providers. They do have some different incentives. On the technical side, we have about 50 workloads. Now, when I say a workload here, I mean a distinct application. Um, it could be a single server application, it could be a large multi-server uh, web type cluster. Um, we have 50 of these approximately, at least that's what we're told. Turns out that there's quite a few more. In fact, it's more like 80, um, and they're all different. Every application is different. They have different complexities. Um, they're all running on VMware, but we have different databases. Um, we have SQL Server. We have Oracle. Sorry, I said it. Apologies. We have um, Postgres. We have MySQL. Um, we have all of these databases, and we need to move them to the cloud. Okay, that's not a problem. Mainly running Linux, which is, in my mind, a good thing. Um, but we do have some Windows. The apps are a mix of internally developed software and some commercial software. Um, the commercial software is not all up to date. In some cases, uh, it's very out of date. And that's going to be its own little special hell. Um, and we won't talk about that today because I don't want to remember. Another decision was made as well. This was also a good decision. We're going to do infrastructure as code. Now, I, I want to emphasize here, the business made these decisions, not the company I was working for as a service provider. The business had already decided we're going to AWS. We want to use infrastructure as code. They have a very enlightened CTO. We're also going to follow AWS best practices, the well-architected framework. Is anyone here, is everyone an AWS person? <laughs> Why aren't you at reInvent? Are you all on-prem hosted people? No. Yes, some. Azure? Always. Oh. <sighs> yeah, I've got a, a joke about that, but it's probably not appropriate for recording. Um. <laughs> okay, but the choice was made. And again, it's not a problem to have these decisions made, but it would have been nice to have a little bit more forewarning. There's nothing wrong with following best practices in in fact, if you, even if you're not an AWS person, read the well-architected framework. It will validate a lot of what you've been doing in non-AWS environments already. It's not really AWS specific at all. It's just good practices. On the project side, well, this was already decided. We're going, to, we're going to do a lift and shift to the cloud. And now I'm starting to panic because of those three little words, lift and shift. Normally when we talk about moving to the cloud, there's an underlying assumption that we're going to try to be cloud native. We're going to try to use the features of the cloud because part of the reasoning behind moving to the cloud is to get access to those features, to get access to elasticity. Right, the ability to create and um, delete resources as we need them. We get access to better engineering because frankly, a lot of these cloud providers do better engineering than most of us ever could. They have more resources, they have more engineers. Um, they've got a lot of experience thinking about things from a very large scale. And that translates to reliability. But we pay for that. On the other hand, we also get to see exactly what we're paying for. We get transparency into payment, and that's good for businesses, at least in theory. So we have to do a lift and shift of everything that's in the data center 
into the cloud. Those 50 applications, those 50 workloads, aren't all that's in the data center. We have firewalls. We have Wi-Fi management. We have a bunch of other infrastructure that wasn't included. So add that to the list of things to move. Everything has to be preserved. It's not just the workloads. We also have to preserve the ways of working because of our outsource providers. We can't afford to just throw them away, which means we have to keep working the way we've been working. So not only aren't we going to get a lot of advantages from moving to the cloud that the cloud itself offers, we have to maintain existing ways of work, regardless of whether they're efficient, regardless of whether they're helpful to the business, they have to be maintained. And one more thing. We have to avoid vendor locking. That's an explicit requirement from the customer. <laughs> so this started off as being, yes, this is going to be a great engagement to, oh dear, um, how, how are we going to achieve this? I mean, let's face it, if you've chosen a cloud provider, you've already started that vendor lock-in pathway. <laughs> okay, let's, let's hold the open stack for later and then I'll give you the joke. Well, I can tell you the joke now. Um, I was expecting to hear Dutch um, in a particular situation. Uh, and as, as I said, I've been learning Dutch and getting better. And instead of open, sack, open stack, I heard klootzak. <laughs> and now I can't unhear it. So whenever you say open stack, yeah, there's my reaction. OK. We can cut that from the tape, right? Do finish in post. So we have this set of conflicting requirements here. We've chosen to go to AWS. We've chosen to preserve our processes um, and our workload structures. But we don't want vendor lock-in, even if we've already accepted vendor lock-in, which is kind of, kind of annoying. And so I, I asked the CTO some, some questions. Why? Okay, why, why do we have these constraints? And I've already given you some of the answers here. Um, it's easy to just say go to AWS or go to Azure or go to um, GCP. Why was this provider chosen? And I'm given some reasons and the reasons don't really matter because when it gets down to it, that decision is done. But they're good reasons, okay. What about the scope? Um, what, what, what about how much vendor locking? I mean, clearly we have some vendor locking already. Can we change anything? We'll get there. Perhaps most importantly, ooh, we've missed a very important fact. We want the ability to change providers with short notice. Okay. So how long is short? Not 60 minutes, not five years, but you've bracketed it nicely. <laughs> Any other takers? Hang on. We'll get there, the reveal. Oh yeah, development languages. Any Java fans? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, so how long? Six months. So we have a 14-month project to move. Now it's 80 workloads. Yeah, okay, well, this is a new laptop. It's a new presentation tool. It's a new everything. <laughs> Six months for a project which is taking roughly 40 people, 14, 15 months. Roughly, it's grown by this point 100 workloads. How can we avoid vendor lock-in, but also allow us to move in six months? Now, the, the obvious answer at this conference is, let's do everything in open source. Okay? 
but six months. We can't really move everything in six months because we're not abstracted enough. We have 80 different pets, or 100, roughly 100 different pets. Um, we all know that pets are not great for management. The approaches we're taking are also not designed to support migration. Right? We have 10 years of history in these processes. Well, this sucks. So what can we do? Well, at this point, I just want to remind that um, I'm giving you some background. This is all background, but it should be the same as the types of problems you're seeing yourselves. Um, and it is easy to be critical in hindsight. I'm being really critical here, including of my own role in this. Um, some things I tried and I got away with. Some things I tried and didn't get away with. Um, some things I tried really, really, really hard and um, was told really, really, really hard, no, don't do this. It is what it is. Um, it's really easy to see things after the fact, um, and that, that has helped us, um, because believe it or not, six months later, this kind of got activated. All right, so we made some critical decisions in all of this. We had decided to follow a pretty common understanding, which is we separate presentation and data. We separate um, infrastructure and applications. Um, and this was already the model that was in use. Um, following this allowed us to keep using our existing application deployment methods. We didn't change those. We couldn't, there was just too much invested but we needed to get our infrastructure deployed. Um, so what we did was we decided that we would use Terraform. Um, again, it's a choice. Some people would have said CloudFormation because it's AWS native. The argument for Terraform that was put forward was it's less locked in to AWS. Um, but if you've ever used Terraform, you know that that's a, uh, a false argument because all the resources are AWS underscore something. So if you want to move to a different provider, you now have to change the resource type anyway. But it provided a common language, and that was the benefit for us. Um, we would specifically use uh, version 11, 0.11, um, which was not the most current at the time, but it wasn't the oldest. Um, Terraform tends to run about three versions, um, future, stable, and uh, older. But this was okay. There are some limitations. We can live with those. The next critical decision we made was to do with the way we work with the code. Now, infrastructure is not application. The way you work with um, single sources of truth is different. And we decided that we would not build specific artifacts, we would simply use our repositories as a source of truth. Um, this is a good choice, but it has consequences. All right, we decided that we would deploy from master. This is a debatable choice. Um, some people will say, I want a branch, I want to deploy from production, I will, I will merge to the production branch. But when we looked at this, we thought about the people who would need to be doing the work to maintain the infrastructure. And they didn't have a lot of experience with repositories, let alone Git or release management. Uh oh. But that's okay. We kept it as simple as possible. Um, but when you deploy from your master branch only, when you don't have uh, release branching, that also has costs. Some things become really difficult to do. Experimenting is difficult. Testing is difficult. Not impossible, just difficult, a little more annoying. Um, we also made a decision that our repository provider would be GitHub with CircleCI. Um, why? 
Well, the customer had stated a preference for SAS. Um, this is not a bad thing in and of itself. But the second part of the choice was to actually look at what the company I was working for had as internal skill sets. So we didn't really look at what the customer needed directly, but what we could provide to the customer. Remember I talked about alignment of interests? This was one of the first areas where um, we ended up paying a little bit in the long term. But we'll get there. Both of these were presented as ways of de-risking. We had a tight timeline, or it was a perceived to be tight timeline. Um, we needed to be out of a data center, or else penalties would apply, and the penalties were more than the cost of actually completing the project. We would have to have entered into more long-term contracts, and so on. So there was a hard deadline. Again, this is all real-world stuff. Um, data center space, even with the cloud, is getting even more expensive. Has anyone noticed their price for um, data center hosting going down? No. <laughs> um, and that's, that's not even with the power included. So you know, we, we had hard deadlines. We had quite good contracts. We knew that the renewed contracts would not be as good. OK. Oops. And we're still lifting and shifting. Remember this. We're still lifting and shifting. So really, the only choice we've got here, we can't do anything smart. We have to duplicate and then flip the traffic across per application, um, which means we need to get some things right. We need to get internal and external DNS um, split and configured correctly. Yeah, because remember, we're running two at once. We want to manage everything in code. So the things that are in AWS won't be managed the same way the legacy is managed for that transition period. So. Some DNS entries, for example, will start here and need to move over to AWS. So split's probably not the right word because that means something else in a DNS context. Um, but we do need to run hybrid DNS, and we need to be careful about who's controlling one. And that's the easy case. We have networking that's the same. Um, this organization is international. They have. Um, Entities across six different countries. Um, the networking was different for each country. We were only doing three countries. It was a mess. I'm, 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 I'm was there a mess in <laughs> um, Short answer, yes. There were also um, firewalls involved, Palo Altos. Um, and there were other firewalls. Not all the entities were consistently managed. Again, I'm leaving out those parts because they're not really relevant to the pipelines. All right. From the project management side, we had an on-premise GitLab. Excellent, but we're not going to use that. We're going to use GitHub. We use Ansible for managing host configurations. In fact, the Ansible was managed by two of our outsource providers. This is good. We don't change that. In fact, we're not going to use that, and there's a little problem in itself. We currently use Jenkins. None of these are bad choices, um, but they're also not choices that we could take and use in exactly the same way to move things to the cloud. A lot of configuration, though, was still managed by keyboard and mouse. A lot. You need a new VM? Clicky, clicky. Yeah. You need to configure that new VM. Clicky, clicky, clicky. Maybe we'll set up Ansible on that one. It was not consistent. It's a mess. Remember, the real world is messy. And this is, this is not a bad thing. This is just how it is. We've all had environments that are like this. I didn't say that. 10 years ago, yes. Oops. Uh, slide mix. All right. So let's get on to pipelines. Why were the pipelines critical for us? Well, first of all, I'm a big automation fan. Um, that's what I tend to talk about, is some form of automation. And for us, pipelines were critical because we needed to be able to show non-technical people what was happening with their deployments. 
non-technical people were in control of deployments. So we needed some kind of GUI. That's one of the reasons why a makefile wouldn't, wouldn't cut it here. Um, if anybody develops a SaaS product which is makefiles under the hood but with a pretty GUI for non-tech people, they're going to make a fortune, at least out of me. Um, by having a standard approach to pipelines, we, we started to build an automation framework for the entire organization. This is the way that infrastructure is deployed. There are no exceptions. Um, we don't click. We only click when the, the software, the, the tooling, absolutely cannot support us doing that. We'll put effort into maintaining this and automating it. And we wanted to do this deliberately because of that six month change over time. If we get this part right, even if we have to change our Terraform, our processes are going to be easily transportable. Remember we used GitHub and CircleCI. These are not locked to AWS. Right? We can use the same approach in Azure or in GCP. So at least this part is easy to move within six months, maybe. Every workload is treated the same. That means the providers do need to have a little bit of an update in their skills. Um, but on the plus side for the providers, there's less variation. It's easier to support their applications when the infrastructure is more consistent. So this was a net win. The providers initially weren't happy, but they quickly came to, to see the benefits here. 10 minutes. Really? Yeah. I talk too much. OK. Um, and it's easy to copy paste. I'm going to go really fast here. There were some human factors. I just mentioned getting the providers to start skilling up a little bit. Um, but having these pipelines meant that people could see what was happening, they could understand what was happening, and it was easier for them to start to think about how they might make changes. Um, we also had manual gates for our service management people to approve deployments which was something that was built into the organization's ways of work. We couldn't change this. Service management chooses to deploy to production, not the engineers, not the application owners. Um, it gave us a consistent pattern for doing all our infrastructure work. And this has been fantastic. Um, I mean, I don't want to have to sell you on doing pipelines properly. Um, but we had a problem here. And the problem was that every workload was moved independently. Um, so at one stage, we checked for the 51 pipelines that I looked at. Who'd like to guess how many different pipelines there were? No. <laughs> 60, yes, close enough. 48 different pipelines. So we still had a maintenance problem. If you wanted to make a pipeline change, you actually had to go in and look at the pipeline and understand exactly what this specific pipeline was doing for this specific workload. That sucks. It's also really error prone. We had a lot of problems with things being broken. And from a service provider perspective, that's not good. You're wasting time that your customer isn't paying for. Okay. Our pipelines looked like this. Well, this was the, the flow, but um, we're gonna, it's going to work, yes. Um, everything was run from CircleCI. We had a pool of runners to do the work, blah, blah, blah. Um, but here's the kicker. We owned the runners, not the customer. So these runners were shared with our other customers. We had to manage permissions in a way that... Um, we were comfortable with and the customers would be comfortable with if they understood what was happening under the hood. Um, and we were often competing for these runners. So deployments could be slow. Something that might take two minutes would take 20 minutes. So that sucked. This is what the pipelines themselves really look like. There's a pre-merge step. Remember we deploy from main, master. So merge requests come first, we check those, if we're okay, we merge them, and we post-merge across. We send through to production. Except we had one pipeline and one repo for every environment. 
and for those environments that had development, testing, acceptance, and production. Can you see where I'm going with this? When you wanted to make a change that was consistent across all environments, you didn't make one change. You made four. This was a problem. Um, but it's also not the first time I've seen this done. All right, let's be honest. Who's done this before? Yeah. I am very grateful for that because I took this and I said, this is not DTAP. This is not the way to do this. Let's do better. And this is what we did. First of all, we took our Terraform code for the four different environments and we parameterized it by environment. So if something needed to be different, needed to be present in all of them, but different in each environment, that's a parameter. Okay, this is, this is good, this is reasonably obvious. There are some environments where that wasn't possible, right, for structural reasons. So we had conditionals in the Terraform. This is its own problem, but we'll get there. Um, we also fixed that security issue with everything being shared customers, one super, super user role. But this is what it came to look like. Can anyone see problems with this approach? No? Lots of manual actions, which is great for this customer, but we're trying to help the customer improve and get closer to being cloud native. Remember that journey? Yeah. So this is where we ended up. Um, and that was all pretty cool, um, pretty normal, nothing special. Um, we've got our infrastructure in code, where our pipelines are defined, they're in text, and it's not just a GUI that nobody understands how to run. Team City, I'm looking at you. Um, security wasn't great, um, but every pipeline was a pet. Great, not great. And that's not so bad, it is what it is. But we could keep making mistakes. So let's call it technical debt. Move on. Okay, let's move on. We're moving to GitLab now. Great. We're going to replace our provider at the same time with an in-house team. And at this point, I changed employers. So we start again. And what we ended up doing was we developed a generalized pipeline. We set some hard and fast rules and we said to the application owners, too bad. These are the rules. They are what they are. And we ended up with a pipeline that looked like this in every workload. This is the pipeline. It's the same. <clears throat> what this gave us was the ability to actually manage pipelines centrally. So while I was dissing Team City a few moments ago, um, one of the benefits of Jenkins and Team City and, and those types of tools is everything's managed centrally. If you set it up properly, you can make a global change really, really quickly. You don't have to touch every workload to make a change. And that was the problem we were hitting. We were touching every workload to make a global change. So some changes that were trivial would literally take a week of two or three engineers' time to go through and make the change. Right? That's not great. Um, this approach allowed us to start experimenting and testing a lot more. So our pipeline reliability has gone way up. We haven't really broken a pipeline now for about six months. Occasionally we get one that's blocked for other reasons, but that's, you know, it is what it is. We still have some pets. Um, we have pets because of performance reasons. If you've got um, a bunch of environments that need to be deployed. You don't want to do them line linearly. You want to parallelize them. Um, we're looking at moving our, all our pipelines to use that same model. So we'll have even less pets in about three months. On the back end, what this looks like is, um, and I'm going to go off, off script here. You can look at the YAML, but 
we generate the pipelines dynamically now. Every pipeline in the repo that has the workload is the same, and what that does is it triggers a process which generates the pipeline for that workload. If you have a DTAP, it generates a four-stage pipeline. If you have PR only, it's a one-stage pipeline. The approvals are consistent now. Um, if you have multi-stage pipeline, the first stage you can approve and deploy locally and then merge later. Um, I wanted to show you the actual code to do this, but I haven't got that far. Um, what I do want to close with is to say, what I've actually done here is started off with really shitty click in the console, then we code it in a file, and then we abstract it away. Right? This is a pattern of automation. It's actually really easy to get this working, and it's not limited to GitLab. Um, Circle CI and GitHub Actions are both ways to dynamically generate parts of your pipeline based on the requirements you know today. We actually took the approach of doing this because we were going absolutely crazy with pipeline changes that were just out of control. Um, we couldn't support our customers, we couldn't support the workloads until we moved to this. Now we spend very little time touching the pipelines. When we need to make a pipeline change, every workload gets it and they're upgraded dynamically and organically as we uh, touch them the next time. Was this a good project? Yes. Was there a lot of learning? Hell yes. Um, would I do it the same way again? No. What I would do next time is I would say we start here. Um, because what doing this did was it forced all the application owners to work the same way without really breaking um, our constraints, our customer constraints. We moved from, um, we didn't change cloud providers, we moved from service provider in just under two months. We built a team in just under two months and we could not have done that without this approach. Could we move to, the, to a different cloud? in under six months? No, but it wouldn't take 14 months. We believe it would take about eight. And we're working towards a six month approach now. Yes, quickly. Yeah, so what? Yeah. It is, and it, on day one of this project, absolutely, and that was part of the reason that a lot of these decisions were made, um, and then there was this pulling back and saying, well, um, it's got to be lift and shift, because the customer didn't understand, they didn't truly appreciate what they would get by moving to the cloud. Now we've started to move some of these workloads to be more cloud native, and the customer can see they, they're cheaper to run, um, they're faster to make changes to, so the customer is more responsive in those workloads, and now they can see the benefit of working on the cloud. So, so sorry. sorry. I, I, like, cut it off here, but uh, you'll be here. Oh, I will be here for the rest of the day. Um, please come and see me, and thank you. I appreciate this wasn't complete, um, and I probably spent a bit too much time on the context. Um, but please come and see me. I might be able to show you some code. I'll have to see what I've got on the laptop. Um, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you.